Hey, Precog, this is some more Unit 9 trig graphing today. These are actually the last new type of graphs we're going to learn about. They are called the inverse trig function graphs. Now, inverse trig is different than reciprocal. So we're not looking at cosecant or secant or cotangent. We're going to look at something like sine inverse, cos inverse, and tan inverse today. But we have to recall what types of functions have inverses to begin with. And this brings us actually all the way back to Unit 3. So when we talked about inverses and their relationships to the original functions, really in order to have an inverse, the function has to be one-to-one. -one. And if you remember one-to-one, -one, it's just that the X and Y values have a one-to-one -one correspondence, meaning graphically it would pass the vertical line test to be a function and pass the horizontal line test for the inverse to be a function. And since I'm hoping at this point we have a pretty good understanding as to what sine, cosine, and tangent look like, are any of those one-to-one -one functions? And the big answer to that is absolutely not. They would all fail the horizontal line test. So here's the key idea for today. We are going to restrict these trig functions to a domain. So we have to restrict the trig functions to a domain that is one-to-one -one so that we can create inverse trig functions whose domains are the range of the original trig functions. Because remember, what happens when you do an inverse is that you're going to take the x and y values and you're going to switch them. So if we know domain and range represent x and y values, those are going to get switched. But like we were saying, here's a graph of sine x. It's good old sine x from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. You can see here that we're definitely going to fail the horizontal line test. So if we start right at 0, 0 at this point, my question to you would be is how far can I go along the sine curve until I would fail the horizontal line test? And you can go a decent way. You can go all the way up until pi over 2. But the second I go beyond pi over 2, we fail the horizontal line test right up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the curve right here. I'm going to make this one of my boundaries at pi over 2. But I could actually capture a little bit more of the graph that's 1 to 1 if I go backwards. So if you go to the left a little bit, I can go all the way until negative pi over 2 until we would also fail the horizontal line test there. So those two dividers, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, that's the restriction we're going to put on the domain of sine x so that the inverse is, in fact, a function. So how do I take this information right here and translate it to the graph of arc sine x? Arc sine, by the way, is a fancy name for saying sine to the negative 1 of x. That's the graph that we're generating right now. Well, something that I'll have you recall, like I just said a moment ago, is that we have some key points here. And if we take the x and y values and switch them, so let's see, this point right here is at negative pi over 2, comma, negative 1. We do go right through the origin, 0, 0. And then this is at pi over 2, comma, 1. I know that if I were to go to graph the inverse, I have actually three points on the inverse. If I switch the x and y values here, it would be negative 1, negative pi over 2, 0, 0, and then positive 1, pi over 2. Take those x and y values and switch them. So I'll have you take a look at these x and y values for a second and realize that the negative 1 to 1 used to be on the y-axis for sine x. For arc sine of x, that's going to be the values that we look at on the x-axis. This is the new domain of the function. And what used to be x values, negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, those now become y values. So we're going to put those on the y-axis. And it turns out if you plot these three things as points, here's negative 1, negative pi over 2, or approximately 0, 0, and then 1, comma, pi over 2. You know, I'll tell you that these do not get connected in a straight line. It's going to somehow follow a curved type pattern based on the orientation here. But I want you to think about, lastly, what if I flip this over the line y equals x? What's that going to look like? Because that's the graphical representation between a function and its inverse. Flipping that over y equals x, isn't it going to bend this way first and then turn this way? So it's going to bend like this and then curve up like that. Okay, That is the graph of sine inverse of x or arc sine of x. It has those specific endpoints. Because if you go any further and take some more points, you're going to start getting something that's not a function anymore. It's going to start wrapping around the y-axis like that. So could I have taken more points and switched the x and y values? Yeah, but it's going to start becoming something that's not a function. This is the only part that we'll see. In fact, if you go to your calculator and type in sine inverse of x and y1, it will only show you that part of the graph. So let's talk about what we restricted the domain to be. The domain we cut off was negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. 
and the range over that interval is negative one to one. So that's looking at the original function, sine x. The range is negative one to one. Here's the restricted domain. Well, when I find arc sine of x, which is the inverse, those two things get switched. So now we can see that the domain is from negative one to one and that the range is from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Now we're gonna be talking today about inputs and outputs. And hopefully you remember that domain is what you input to the function. So you can plug in whatever you want for arc sine of x, as long as it's from negative one to one. So those are the, the range of values you can plug in. And I always said range, even though this is the domain, this is the span of values I'll say that you can plug in for x for the arc sine of function. And the outputted values will only be from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So what I want you to think about is what quadrants does that cover? Those output angles, negative pi over two to positive pi over two? Well, negative pi over two is here. Positive pi over two is here, if I think about where those quadrantal locations are. So based on all of that, if I'm only getting angles from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, we're not in quadrants two and three, which means you are only in quadrant one or quadrant four, okay? That's gonna take a little while to get used to, but that's never gonna change. The function arc sine of x only gives you answers in quadrants one and four. So let's talk about how we're going to use this to evaluate. If I asked you to do sine inverse of a half, a half is clearly in the domain of sine inverse. The answer to that is an angle somewhere from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So let's go ahead and take a look. I know that sine inverse is definitely not in quadrants two and three. And out of these two quadrants, we can still use all star trig class to figure out where this triangle should be to figure out what the angle is. Well, if this is a positive ratio out of these two quadrants, sine is definitely positive in quadrant one. All right, and sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So if I label all the sides, we do have a special triangle here. Based on all of that, hopefully you remember that the reference angle here is across from the 130 degrees or pi over six. I'm just gonna write radians today because that's gonna be the most common value that we um, write down and you should be pretty used to writing answers in radians anyway. Now, I know it's not a question that's written down here, but you'll be shocked to see what the answer to sine inverse of negative one half is. It's not that different of a process, but for sine inverse of negative a half, here's what we're gonna do. We know sine inverse is definitely not in these two quadrants, but when this ratio is negative, the angle must have come from quadrant four then where sine is negative. So opposite over hypotenuse, it's the same exact triangle. It's even the same exact reference angle. This is a reference of 30 degrees or pi over six. But remember the only answers we can get happen to be from negative 90 to positive 90. So if this is a reference of 30, you're not gonna say that the answer is 330 degrees. That's what we used to say back when we were dealing with things that weren't sine inverse related. But the answer is not 330, the answer happens to be negative 30 degrees or negative pi over six in radians. Okay, so that's gonna look a little bit different in terms of when we evaluate with sine inverse, we're not getting that quadrant four angle in the typical way that we used to. We're getting that quadrant four angle by saying, oh, rotating clockwise that many degrees or that many radians, we would just put a negative in front. Just make sure your answer is somewhere from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, which this one is. Takes some time to get used to, but let's move on to arc cosine of x, okay? And again, arc cosine of x is the same idea as cosine inverse. So for cos inverse, let's start in that same type of spot. I say, say same type of spot, because before we started at zero, zero for sine, but here's two cycles of the cosine curve. Let's start at x equals zero and say, how far can I travel to the right until I fail the horizontal line test. Well, I can actually go pretty far, can't I? We can go all the way through pi over two and all the way down to pi, and then I have to stop here. So if I go any further, I'm gonna fail the horizontal line test. So I'm gonna break up one of my boundaries at pi. Now, if you think about what we did a moment ago for sine x, didn't I try and travel to the left a little bit from zero to and see if I can capture more of the curve that's that happens to be one to one? Turns out you can't get very far, right? If you go to the left at all, we start failing the horizontal line test right away. So the restricted domain for cosine of x that's gonna work here is from zero to pi. Those are the boundaries we're gonna cut off for arc cosine x. So what we're gonna do is capture these three points. 
Okay, so that's zero one. This point right here is at pi over two comma zero. And then down here, you're at pi negative one. And then we're gonna flip those coordinates around. So again, if it helped you like I did before to make that quick little table to see where these points are going, we're gonna have one zero, zero pi over two, and then negative one pi. Okay. Notice how the domain is going from negative one to positive one. So let's set the X axis to be negative one to one again. And at this time, the range, I don't see any negative Y values in the range like we had earlier because we didn't go to the left of the X axis at all. But we're going from zero up to pi. Okay, so we're gonna have pi up here. And in the middle would be pi over two. And we're gonna start here at one zero. Next, we're at zero comma pi over two. And finally, we end at negative one pi and again, thinking about flipping this over the line y equals x, the orientation of the curve is it's going to wrap around like this. In terms of thinking about, you know, how should I bend the curve, think about flipping it over the y equals x line. Or if you don't like that idea as much, then think about the fact that these graphs are not wrapping around the x-axis anymore. It's going to want to wrap around the y-axis. But we're not going to let it because then it wouldn't be a function. Okay, so here's the exact graph for cos inverse. It never changes, by the way. We're not tr transforming these at all. Like this is it. Arc cos always looks like this. All right, let's talk about the restricted domain that we use. For arc cos, we took cosine x and we cut it off from zero to pi. And the range was negative one to one. So same idea. We know for arc cos, which is the inverse, we kind of switch those around. So now the Domain is negative one to one. The range is zero to pi. So these are the inputs. We're allowed to plug in anything from for the arc cosine function between negative one to one. And the answers will be somewhere from zero to pi. This is probably a little bit easier for you to visualize because zero to pi means that I'm starting here. We end here. Answers for arc cos never go into quadrants three and four. So arc cosine x will output angles in quadrants one and two. And that's it. All right, you can see in these evaluate questions, we have the, kind of the same two questions, but one's positive and one's negative. So we'll talk about how that's going to make a difference. For cos inverse of radical 2 over 2, the first thing I'm going to actually have you think about here is that it's the same thing as 1 over radical 2, right? This is the rationalized form of 1 over radical 2. And I think to write it that way will make our job easier when we have to find the reference angle. I know that our cos is not in the bottom two quadrants. It's only in 1 and 2. So when I label for cos, cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. The answer to an inverse question is this angle right here. What is that angle? Well, when the hypotenuse is radical 2, remember this is the 1, 1 radical 2 triangle. So the answer in radians is pi over 4. That's the reference angle. Well, how does that change when I have a negative out front? It's really not all that different. But again, think of this as cos inverse of negative 1 over radical 2. Instead of being in quadrant one, you're going to move over to quadrant two because cosine is negative here, right? All star trig class. All right. So the adjacent's negative one, hypotenuse radical two. It's the same reference angle. This is pi over four. But when I'm in quadrant two, how do I get my answer? Well, if halfway around is pi, which is four pi over four, subtract out that reference of pi over four to get an answer of three pi over four. And I'll tell you, just like with anything in this class, inverses just take some time to get used to conceptually. This is probably one of the tougher parts of this unit. But as far as evaluating with inverses, these types of questions, we're going to do a lot more practice with that in our last lesson of the unit. Okay. All right. Last but not least, let's talk about what tan inverse looks like. Tan inverse or arc tan of X. Tan's a little bit weird, right? Because tan has some different restrictions and some different um, domains and ranges than we typically see for sine and cosine. So the question is, you know, where should I chop up the tan curve? And it turns out that if you steal the entire part between these two asymptotes in the middle of the graph, this whole section of the graph is one to one. This whole piece in between these asymptotes. Okay, if I go anything outside of those asymptotes, it would fail the horizontal line test, okay? So if I went, you know, to the left a little bit, fail the horizontal line test to the right, it would fail down here. But we can take this whole part of the graph, think about taking all these points, switching the x and y values, and then and then we kind of go from there. All right. The trick to tan inverse is that we really only have one point established. We have zero, zero. 
which is, I guess, not all that exciting. Because when I flip zero, zero, you get zero, zero again. But here's something that is kind of interesting. When you have vertical asymptotes on a function, the inverse, they would turn into horizontal asymptotes. So at negative pi over two and positive pi over two, those are now going to become horizontal asymptotes. So go ahead and include those. in your sketch. And then last but not least, since the range of this function is all reals, when I take those X and Y values and switch them, the range becomes the domain over here. So the domain, the list of X values, it's gonna be all real numbers. It's gonna to go to the right forever and go to the left forever. It's just gonna be kind of bound by these two lines right here, okay? So what's gonna happen is if you flip this graph over the line Y equals X, it's gonna approach negative pi over two from below and then cross through the origin, and then as you go to the right forever, it's gonna approach positive pi over two. If you really wanted to take a few other points on this interval and switch X and Y values, we could, but I think as long as you kind of just know what the general shape looks like and that it has those two horizontal asymptotes, we're kind of in a good place. All right, I'll tell you the restricted domain for tan is the same one that we looked at for sine to start with. We cut it off from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, however, Notice how I can include those values because those are where the asymptotes are. So if I go right back to the beginning, that's the same thing that we said for sine x, but sine x we had brackets there. Whereas for tan, just be careful that we do need parentheses. That becomes the range for arc tan, right? The y values for arc tan are somewhere from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. The range of tan, we just talked about this a moment ago, is all reals. So that turns into a domain of all reals for arc tan, which means you can plug in whatever you want. Remember, these are inputs. Plug in whatever you want for arc tan, but the outputs are still only between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So that's the same range of outputs that we had for sine inverse. Remember, negative pi over two to positive pi over two is only gonna be in quadrants one and four. We're not in quadrant two and we're not in quadrant three. So in terms of the three inverse functions, sine inverse, cos inverse, tan inverse, sine and tan or arc sine and arc tan have the same quadrant restrictions for their output angles. Cos inverse is the only different one. That's in one and two, like we just saw a moment ago. Okay. All right. So last but not least, tan inverse of radical three, what would that be? Well, when this is a positive number, we know tan inverse is not in these quadrants anyway, but when this is positive, you're definitely in quadrant one. All the inverse trig functions are positive only in quadrant one. Tan is opposite over adjacent, okay? So you can put this as radical three over one if you'd like. Notice how these are all kind of special angles, which will be true for the rest of the unit. If this is the angle that I'm looking for, the answer to this inverse question is the angle X that I've labeled across from radical three is pi over three, okay? And then last but not least, if we had a negative out front, we know that that just brings us into quadrant four where tan is negative, still opposite over adjacent, so again, that same exact reference angle, it's still pi over three, but when I rotate clockwise that number of radians, the answer is now negative pi over three. Again, it's gonna play with your mind a little bit because you're gonna want to naturally be inclined to rotate counterclockwise. Notice how that counterclockwise rotation brings us into quadrants where we have restrictions there, okay? So it takes a little while to get used to writing this is our answer, but I promise with more practice, you will get used to it just like anything else. All right, I think we're probably good there for today. We'll do these two questions pretty quickly um, when we're at class next time on page 38 of the packet. So if you wanna hold off on those, we can talk about those next time we're in class, but get ready next time I see you for me to just have you take out a piece of paper and graph sine inverse, cos inverse and tan inverse from memory. You will have to know all three without a graphing calculator. Not that I used one today anyway. All right, that's it for inverse trig